It's time for Security Now. Steve Gibson is here. We've got more news about cybersecurity, of course, including, yes, more Spectre and Meltdown news. Oh, man. Plus, uh, how the Russians hacked Twitter and Facebook and a Bitcoin miner that nearly brought T-Mobile to its knees. It's all coming up next on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Security Now is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 651, recorded Tuesday, February 20th, 2018, Russian Meddling Technology. Security Now is brought to you by Kubernetes Engine on Google Cloud Platform. Learn more at g.co slash getgke today. And by IT Pro TV, the fun and entertaining way to sharpen your IT skills. Visit itpro.tv slash security now and use the code SN30 to get a free seven-day trial and 30% off a monthly membership for the lifetime of your active subscription. And by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash security now. It's time for Security Now, the show we cover your security online with this guy right here, Mr. Stephen Gibson from grc.com. Live long and prosper, Steve. Hello. Yo, Leo. Great to be with you again, as always. So we uh, plow in, well, past episode 650. I don't know why that number seems so significant to me, but we're on 651 today. Um, and that a, a piece of information became available last Friday that that I that I thought was interesting and also uh, Tech Dirt's response, Mike over at Tech Dirt, sort of a little bit of a reality check as a consequence. What I'm talking about is what we learned from um, the Mueller investigation about the technology that Russia allegedly used for messing with social media. And and I don't care about the politics. What was interesting to me was like what they did in order to pull this off. And, and this is relevant because right now, in sort of in the wake of that, there's all this comeuppance, uh, you know, I mean, all this furor about the responsibility of Google and Twitter and Facebook and Instagram to like have dealt with this or to have, you know, known better and what can we do coming up? And of course, this put me in mind of the FBI's arguing that encryption was bad and that we needed a golden key. It's like, well, you know, there are things that technology can do and there are things that technology can't. So um, now that we know a little bit more about how this was done, um, we have something to talk about from a technology standpoint, So, I, which I think is sort of interesting about just, you know, the nature of the Internet and how little control over it we really have. But lots of news this week, whereas last week, actually the last couple of weeks have been kind of quiet. Um, so I want to examine and discuss the appearance of um, unfortunately, new forms of meltdown and specter attacks. Oh boy! Uh-huh. Uh huh. There's a, just some beautiful research out of Princeton that uh, revealed something um, that we, I guess, we should have suspected or expected. Um, also, the legal response against Intel. I want to touch on briefly. They had to file their annual uh, 10K report so we know we got a little a glimpse into what would otherwise be proprietary about what the this meltdown and specter vulnerabilities you know have done in terms of backlash which i think is unfortunate because i don't you know i don't think this is intel's fault any more than it's you know it was, it was the nature of the technology also um there's some new cybersecurity legislation 
which is going into effect actually last week and also in coming weeks in New York, which I want to cover and we'll, we'll talk about it. A little bit more on Salon and authorized crypto mining. Um, uh, there's We have a little update on software that cheats auto emissions. Um, a We have, oh, and also a, a, maybe a new coined term, um, in a newly revealed instance of highly profitable, what I would call mal mining. Oh. Um, <laughs> There's a word I don't want to hear again. Uh, mal mining, yes. Mal mining. Uh, I, we, I want to check in on Let's Encrypt Steady Growth, which, as you noted, is the graph that I chose for the picture of the week. Uh, it just keeps on trucking. Uh, we also had the first crack reported of Windows, now in quotes, uncrackable UWP system. Uh, we, I wanted to touch briefly on the uh, iOS and across-the-board updates we got and the crazy Unicode attacks that, that beset Apple, uh, a frightening exter uh, eternal blue experiment, which was contracted for by a company wanting to understand the nature of their vulnerability. And everybody was a little surprised by what it revealed. Also, we have another new aspect of crypto mining annoyance, um, I wanted to uh, make a note now that Chrome's new advertising controls are in place that we've talked about previously and that I know you talked about over the weekend. Um, a bit of closing the loop with our listeners. Um, and then, as I said, I want to look at the, at some of the technological um, cleverness, unfortunately, that apparently uh, Russia got up to in 2016 and whether there's actually anything that we can do about it. So I think a, a chock full podcast. Nice. Very excited. Lots to talk about and also excited to welcome a brand new sponsor to our show. It's a, yeah. a little company out of Mountain View you might have heard of called Google. Uh, <laughs> the Google Cloud Platform. Uh, and, and specifically by the Kubernetes engine. What's Kubernetes? Kubernetes, well, when you're building an application, you need... It to be fast, you need to be secure, and of course, always evolving. With the Kubernetes engine, developers can easily deploy containerized apps on a fully managed service from Google Cloud Platform. Google, of course, has been running production workloads and containers for a long time, more than 10 years. And they have taken what they've learned, uh, all the best practices, and built it into their Kubernetes engine. It combines automatic scaling, updates, and reliable self-healing infrastructure with open source flexibility to cut down your development cycles, help you move from idea to production quickly and reliably. Kubernetes Engine handles scheduling deployment for your workloads to maximize resource optimization so you can focus on your apps. I love it. This, this has really transformed what developers can do now because you no longer have to sweat these details to create something amazing. Auto-scaling allows you to handle increased demand of your services. So as you're first developing, you know, you don't need to have to have, uh, you know, capability to handle a million people. But, you know, when it's a brand new proof of concept, but as you grow, it'll grow with you. And, of course, when you've got quiet periods, it'll scale back down, too. It goes both directions, so you save money. Google is the only hyperscale cloud provider to an offer an SLA for clusters running on Kubernetes. Did you get that? The only hyperscale cloud provider that offers an SLA for you and your clusters running on Kubernetes. Also, of course, backed by Google's experts and expertise in security, their reliability engineering team. It's HIPAA compliant, PCI compliant. If you're in the financial services industry, if you're worried about getting locked in, don't. With Kubernetes Engine, you're free to take your workloads out and run them anywhere Kubernetes is supported. It's a standard, but you might as well use the best. Learn more about Google and their Kubernetes engine at g.co slash get G-K-E. That's g.co slash get G-K-E today. g.co slash G-E-T G-K-E. The Google Kubernetes engine. Just for you high-end developers and people who want to be. Well, some uh, from our... 
uh, and we've discussed this principle often from our attacks never get worse, they only ever get better department. Uh, it was inevitable that there would be additional mo forward motion on the whole meltdown inspector uh, side. I loved the the proud Princeton professor's tweet, which started this. Uh, she tweeted, my PhD student at Caroline Triple developed research tools slash techniques to synthesize security exploits. Yes, her tools find Spectre and Meltdown, but they've also discovered two new related but distinct vulnerabilities using cache coherence protocols. So that's so that's from the the professor of the PhD student or candidate, I guess, who generated a beautiful paper, the research paper. Uh, it was done uh, along with NVIDIA uh, is titled Meltdown Prime and Spectre Prime Automatically Synthesized Attacks Exploiting Invalidation Based Coherence Protocols, which is sort of the academic formal way of talking about the idea that you have some situation where caching is valid or invalid and you need to maintain so-called cache coherence. That is, you need to make sure that what's in the cache is coherent with what's stored in main memory so that it's so that the cache is a is a faster access scratch pad, but you need to maintain coherence. And so uh, and that's a that's an issue when you've got multiple things accessing a shared cache. You need to make sure that they both have the same view of the data at all times. Anyway, so these researchers developed a tool which using, you know, mathematical rigor to formalize the, essentially the underlying architectural characteristics which enabled the creation of the meltdown inspector side channel attacks. So they sort of stepped back and generalized the whole problem saying that, okay, wait, so here's a couple, you know, Spectre and Meltdown are specific instances of an attack, but, you know, is there a broader problem here? And what they answered, you know, they came up with, uh, oops, yes. Uh, and one has to think that if not before now, then certainly since the summer when this was first revealed to them, that, that, that revealed to Intel, sorry, that that revealed to Intel, that Intel would now have similar tools at their disposal. Um, I mean, one would hope. Um, uh, although it's clear that they didn't previously or they didn't think that this could be leveraged into an attack. You know, it's sort of unclear how much of a how, of this came as a surprise? Because as we talked about when we originally talked about uh, the meltdown and Spectre problems, there there was some you know there was some awareness of this decades ago that 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 this was a potential problem. That is, that there was a way to leverage speculation and 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 caching side channels. So anyway, um, this new tool that they built allowed the researchers to to apply mathematical rigor to develop new software-based attacks from the description of the CPU's microarchitecture. Um, and then th this tool essentially writes the code, which is then able to perpetrate the attack. It is specific to specific microarchitectures. On the other hand, what we've seen is that, you know, across a large set of, of microarchitectures, Intel has pretty much done the same thing, which is why they're in trouble across, you know, so many years of their successive chips. Um, so anyway, uh, in their abstract, to give you a sort of a, a sense for the, for the rigor of this, the abstract, that's just the beginning of it, reads... The, melt, the recent meltdown inspector attacks highlight the importance of automated verification techniques for identifying 
hardware security vulnerabilities. We, they write, have developed a tool for automatically synthesizing microarchitecture-specific programs capable of producing any user-specified hardware execution pattern of interest. Our tool takes two inputs, a formal description of a microarchitecture in a domain-specific language, meaning that they invented their own language to describe hardware microarchitectures, um, and a formal description of a microarchitectural execution pattern of interest, for example, a threat pattern. Then they write, all programs synthesized by our tool are capable of producing the specified execution pattern on the supplied microarchitecture. So they succeeded, and when they applied this tool to the Intel microarchitectures, they found previously unsuspected additional problems, which is, <laughs> which is the real takeaway from this. Thus, they called their paper Meltdown Prime and Spectre Prime. Now, in, in some of the press's coverage of this, there was, there was the point raised or the question raised whether this meant that Intel had to go back to the drawing boards yet again with firmware updates. Uh, and that it's not clear one way or the other whether that's going to, you know, whether that's the case, whether the existing firmware fixes will fix this. But what we do have as a consequence of this very rigorous academic research of architectures is first a, a nice step forward in the science of the security of our hardware platforms, which, as I said, would have been nice if we had it quite some while ago, but at least we have it now and, and will moving forward, um, which may be the way that we're able to get the best of both worlds. We, you know, we are not wanting to sacrifice undue performance that we're not, that we've been taking for granted and incorporating into everything we do for the sake of security, but neither do we want architectures that are exploitable. So, I mean, I imagine there's a lot of head scratching going on uh, at Intel and in other chip manufacturers, recognizing that, you know, that this is, a, you know, as we said at the beginning of the year and spent weeks of this podcast talking about, you know, this was not a small event in the history of computer science and this industry. This was a big deal. And, you know, and the repercussions are still being felt. And this kind of fundamental research is just is great to see. So, you know, props to to um, uh, these guys for for pulling that together. And in a kind of a coincidence, because of the timing of Intel's annual report filing there, there's a it's known as the 10K form that has to be filed with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commissions, our, our U.S. Uh, SEC, uh, which, you know, publicly traded companies have to file, where they, they formally lay out, like, uh, you know, where they stand, what the risks of, the, 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 the known risks to purchasers of, of shares of their corporation uh, are, and so forth. Um, you know, it's a long document. It's a 201-page PDF. But, incident, but coincidentally, page 124 of that PDF has to and did address the consequences of this specter and meltdown on Intel. We, you know, we, we talked about it at the time that there was a that the in that the Intel stock suffered as a consequence when people like oh my god, um, you know, this is a big deal. Um, so as a consequence of this report filing, we learned a few things. Um, they said, and I'll I'll give a little bit of of intro here so to to set the stage. In June, the, so this is Intel now in their formal 10K filing wrote in June 2017, a Google research team notified us and other companies that it had identified security vulnerabilities now commonly referred to as specter and meltdown that affect many types of microprocessors including our products as is standard when findings like these are presented we work together with other companies in the industry to verify the research 
and develop and validate software and firmware updates for impacted technologies. On January 3rd, 2018, information on the security vulnerabilities was publicly reported before software and firmware updates to address the vulnerabilities were made widely available. Numerous lawsuits, they wrote, have been filed against Intel and, in certain cases, our executives and directors in U.S. federal and state courts and in certain courts in other countries relating to the Spectre and Meltdown security vulnerabilities. So this they have to disclose per the requirements of the of the 10K filing with the SEC. They wrote, as of February 15th, 2018, 30 customer class action lawsuits and two securities class action lawsuits have been filed. The customer class action plaintiffs who purport to represent various classes of end users of our products generally claim to have been harmed by Intel's actions and or omissions in connection with the security vulnerabilities and assert a variety of common law and statutory claims seeking monetary damages and equitable relief. The securities class action plaintiffs who purport to represent classes of acquirers of Intel stock between July 27th, 2017 and January 4th, 2018. So that is that, you know, that that period after which Intel knew about this and the world found out about it, they say generally allege that Intel and certain officers violated securities laws by making statements about Intel's products and internal controls that were revealed to be false or misleading by the disclosure of the security vulnerabilities. Additional lawsuits and claims may be asserted on behalf of customers and shareholders seeking monetary damages or other related relief. We dispute the claims described above and intend to defend the lawsuits vigorously. Given the procedural posture and nature of these cases, including the proceedings, including that the proceedings are in the early stages, that alleged damages have not been specified, that uncertainty exists as to the likelihood of a class or classes being certified or the ultimate size of any class or classes if certified and that there are significant factual and legal issues to be resolved, we are unable, Intel concludes, to make a reasonable estimate of the potential loss or range of losses, if any, that might arise from these matters. So, um, you know, I regard this as unfortunate. Um, that is, um, this is, I'm sure this is business as usual. I'm sure that for a company Intel size, there are always people who are upset. They buy stock, it goes down. They, they sue people and try to find, you know, some relief. And we know that class actions themselves can often be kind of sketchy where the, the individual plaintiffs, uh, haven't suffered damage, but they're aggrieved or feel aggrieved. You know, who knows how this is going to come out? My, I'm just sort of sad that that something which, from a tech, from a technology standpoint, you, you could argue everybody was doing, and we were all happy. We were all benefiting from the fact that we were using chi a chip architecture, which was which could be cleverly leveraged to create some information leakage, but in return we were getting performance that we're now being asked to give up to varying degrees, you know, and, I, and I'm, as I'm, you know, keeping an eye on this, there's, you know, as we are, we're still as an industry learning more about what this means. In some cases, uh, you know, I'm, and I'm kind of watching Intel and AMD and ARM and in some cases, the documentation is being changed in order to make some of the instructions more clear that can be used for flushing speculation and um, and and synchronizing uh, multiple cores. In some cases, the behavior of the instructions is being subtly changed in order to create more rigor where some was lacking. Um, but you know, I'm I'm sure. Intel is adequately able to defend themselves and 
will be able to bring out experts that say, yeah, um, this was unfortunate, but this wasn't negligent. I, I, it's hard to see that, uh, that, you know, that was. And also, it's certainly the case that the delay from disclosing from, from Intel's learning about this to disclosing was was also reasonable because they had a lot of work to do, as I've said in the last few weeks, in order to remediate the the consequences of what Google found and reported. Um, and you know, they as we also know, they weren't quite done by the time this all went public, and everybody kind of tripped over themselves uh, when that finally happened. So, anyway, th- this is a, a a huge, huge event for our industry and we're still seeing repercussions from it. Um, um, also last week, uh, later in the week, New York State's new cybersecurity laws, which were actually put on the books um, in March of 2017, so, uh, but but the nature of them were that at some at some given date, certain the following things had to happen by, you know, that happened, the, the beginning of that happened last week. So, so what has happened is there's essentially an effort to create more accountability about the cybersecurity efforts that major corporations, uh, largely banks, uh, but also insurers and financial service organizations have put in place in order to protect their customers. So it affects over 3,000 banks. And essentially, the the legislation requires that senior executives at the chairman of the board of directors or a senior officer like a, a CEO personally certify that their computer networks are protected by a cybersecurity program appropriate to their organization's risk profile. Um, there's a, uh, th- this, is, this is from the New York Department of Financial Services, which are attempting to create some accountability and oversight so that, I mean, and, and we know that, you know, making these sorts of statements doesn't prove anything. It's, it, it's different than, than uh, audits from, from outside firms and active enforcement, but it feels like it's a start. Um, they, the, as of last week, these more than 3000 firms had to have a very top level executive formally attest to the following six points that their firm had adopted a cybersecurity program appropriate to their companies, often a bank's risk profile that they had adopted cybersecurity policies designed to protect the bank's information systems and the customer data they hold, appointed a chief information security officer responsible for overseeing and implementing the bank's cybersecurity program and enforcing its cybersecurity policy, so somebody to deal with those first two points, engaged qualified cybersecurity personnel either staff or contractors to work with the that company's CISO uh, in managing the company's risk, developed an incident response plan and taken steps to control privilege access to its IT network. So, you know, those all seem like reasonable things to ask for a large organization which is doing all these things. But what we have found in past years when specific events have happened, uh, and, and we've covered it on the podcast, is like, wait, uh, you don't have a cybersecurity plan? You don't have any staff who's doing this? You, I mean, so so what we found is that these things have just been negligently lacking. So at least this is intended to focus the attention of of corporate management on the need for these things. Um, and they had plenty of time to to pull this together. So, you know, this isn't uh, external audits on an ongoing basis, but it's a start. Then, two weeks from now, on the beginning of March, on March 1st, 
The second is the second implementation deadline for this same legislation, which will then be a year old, um, and five more, some much more substantial regulations and provisions come into force. They have to have implemented either continuous monitoring or periodic penetration testing and vulnerability assessment for their network. So, you know, active participation in this conducted a full scale risk assessment of their information systems, which will be used to inform their cybersecurity program, implement multi-factor authentication for remote access and, um, and, and perhaps more widely used as indicated by, the risk, by what the risk assessment showed, provide regular cybersecurity awareness training for their staff, and begin annual reporting from the CISO to the board of directors. So, again, things that you would hope any large, especially a, you know, a large banking organization where this stuff is critical would already have well in place. But what we found is no one was really looking until we found instance after instance where this wasn't done. So New York state has said, okay, you know, we're going to, we're going to make the management of these major corporations, you know, attest to the fact that these things have done, have, have been done. So a step forward, if nothing else. Um, we talked last week about Salon uh, hoping to monetize opt-in cryptocurrency mining. Uh, and I read in the as a consequence of the news of that, a number of interviews of Jordan Hoffner, who is the CEO of the Salon Media Group. Um, and... You know, there wasn't a lot of information there, although I did get some uh, that we'll talk about in a second about this notion of authorized mining. Um, the most curious to me and disingenuous thing that I saw from these interviews is this question about CPU usage percentage. Because, you know, in being interviewed, the the interviewers were saying, well, you know, um, I, you know, in one case, I remember one interview said, well, you know, my CPU went to 90% of usage while it was on the FAQ page after I gave it permission to mine. Um, oh, and by the way, I meant to say that I reported last week that I had read reporting that stated that the mining started when you acknowledged that first interstitial blocking page but before you gave explicit permission, it turns out that was true, but then stopped being true. So they changed the behavior of their code, um, so, which may be why, Leo, when you tried it, it didn't just take off and, and pin yeah. your CPU. Yeah. You know, so they, they, you know, they cleaned that up a little bit, with, and that was good. But the problem is, you know, people are saying, whoa, you know, 90% CPU usage. And, and then this, you know, Jordan and, you know, I don't know how technical he is, but he was saying, oh, yes, that's one of the things that we're looking into is there seems to be a great disparity in how much CPU is used. Sometimes it's 5%, sometimes 3 sometimes 90 and And I'm thinking, uh, okay, well, first of all, it's probably the case that you you have something like U Block Origin in place. Uh, it happens that U Block Origin blocks any access to uh, CoinHive from where those those scripts are generated. So you know it's going to you know prevent essentially any CPU usage of mining. Um, but as I mentioned before, my my real concern. I mean, I'm sort of bullish about this concept. That is the I can sort of see this. There's something here that I imagine is going to we're going to see some traction on this. I think it's going to take hold. But JavaScript is the wrong way to do this. Um, it's wrong because it is atrociously low yield. Um, um, so as a consequence, it doesn't work for anybody. Um, it means that 
for value to be generated a a a crazy amount of cpu resource like yes 90 95 100% needs to be taken but as a consequence of the inefficiency of javascript mining which is hugely you know well we know it's it's crypto intensive um the amount of of dollar value or cryptocurrency generated for this in in return for massive cpu use is minuscule so it's going to be incredibly wasteful of system resources and um uh, so what we need for this to succeed is for for mining to move into the browser i mean like to be a native feature of of web browsers if this is what we want to have happen where for example it's able to access the system's gpu and perform reasonable yield mining with all of the proper controls and and you know and metrics and so forth but so you know the 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 concern is my concern is that it feels to me like there's a nugget of something here um also you know users are going to have to understand that yes you know if they if they don't want ads and if they they're going to have to provide value and the value will be shown as their system generating more heat you know their um their cpu suddenly jumping to just shy of 100 you know you still want the system to run but essentially mining will take up all of the other available resources i mean that's the trade off so anyway it's it's just been sort of interesting to i mean there's a lot of interest in this and i, I think it makes sense the problem is we, we i i hope this doesn't stub its toe because we're sort of premature in having a means for for it being cost effective if it turns out it is there's just there's no way that doing this with javascript is cost effective it 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 immediately needs to get moved natively into the browser um or i mean as, as i was sort of you know as i was imagining this you could imagine installing a browser mediated agent on the user's computer that would work too but it just makes more sense if it's native to the browser if the browser just you know which is an app running on the system just has the ability with permission to suck up as much cpu as you choose to give it at this point it's doing that but with you know horribly insecure now what's really interesting is that i i've also read a lot about these coin hive guys and and i've seen i've seen my comment on this podcast retweeted a number of times where i said several months ago when this was beginning um that you know it was impossible to to not at least partially hold the the coin hive people responsible you know i mean that they had to be complicit in this cuz the in the early instances all all of the instances of the use of their script seemed malicious i mean seemed to be you know it was it was all to use my new term mal mining um so they've spun off a subsidiary called authmind authmind.com a u t h e d m i n e.com and it's it's authorized mining by coinhive and um and so if you go to authmind.com and by the way i was told that's what salon is now using you get the following a note to ad block and antivirus vendors there is no need so this is an open letter there is no need to block authmind.com now and you can imagine they're asking people not to because coinhive has gotten immediately blacklisted across the industry there's no need to block they write authmind.com or any scripts hosted on this domain 
Oftmine, God, it's hard to say, Oftmine.com offers a Monero miner that can be embedded into other websites. This miner will only ever run after an explicit opt-in from the user. The miner never starts without this opt-in. Now, I was initially skeptical, but I kept reading and I got convinced. They said, we implemented a secure token to enforce this opt-in on our servers. It is not circumventable by any means, and we pledge that it will stay this way. The opt-in token is only valid for the current browser session at max 24 hours and the current domain. The user will need to opt in again in the next session or on a different domain. The opt-in notice is hosted on our servers and cannot be changed by website owners. There's no way a website owner can start mining without the user knowing. And then they say, click here to see how the opt-in looks. Looks. They say, a detailed and technical explanation of the opt-in can be found in our documentation. We believe, they conclude, that browser-based mining can be a viable alternative for intrusive and annoying ads if used honestly and with, with consent by the user. We kindly ask ad block and antivirus vendors to support us. Please help us build a better web. Cheers. Signed, CoinHive. So this is a, this is a, a, I th from all appearances, a well-designed, properly structured and architected uh, solution to a, that's still script-based, and it'll be interesting to find out how much money, you know, how much value can be mined from JavaScript. Certainly, we can, if, if it's, if, it would be great if it's enough to be viable now, then we have a solution that could potentially work today. If not, then um, we know that we can increase the, 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 the leverage. Um, so then over on CoinHive, they said of their auth mine branch, they said a non-ad blocked miner. They wrote shortly after the launch of CoinHive, several ad blockers have begun blocking our miner. This is unfortunate because we intended CoinHive to be an alternative to ads, precisely for users with ad blockers. Eh, okay, maybe there's a little bit of history being rewritten there. Of course, we have no idea what they intended. However, we have to acknowledge that the decision to block CoinHive was understandable as it was possible to run the miner on a web page without asking the visitor for consent or even informing them. Even some antiviruses now consider our JavaScript miner as a threat, which makes it difficult for website owners to use, Coin, to use CoinHive at all. We implemented AuthMine as a solution to these problems. The JavaScript miner, Simple UI, and CAPTCHA, so they have three services, JavaScript miner, Simple UI, and CAPTCHA, when loaded from AuthMine.com, will never start without asking for consent from the user or, and they say for the simple UI and CAPTCHA, letting them explicitly start mining through a click. We realize this opt-in may be clunky and not fit all too well with your use case, but we strongly believe that being honest with the user will ultimately be beneficial for users and website owners alike. Neither the JavaScript files on authmine.com nor the domain names are currently blocked by any ad blockers or antivirus. We will talk to ad block and antivirus vendors so it will hopefully stay this way. So um, I think this is clever and entirely appropriate. Um, and it does like, I mean, like right now, I'll give websites that want to experiment with this a a um, a, a useful, valid, non-blocked, I mean, truly opt-in 
authenticated way of of using browser side mining um, in order to generate revenue for themselves. So I think this is uh, very interesting. I you know it, it's I think CoinHive did the right thing. It's clear that the CoinHive domain got immediately blacklisted. They're they're being very open. They've got a technology that makes sense. I understood what they meant when they said it's, you know, we understand it may interfere with the flow of a website. You can imagine that a website would just like to get, it would itself like to get permission from the user and then have the mining proceed rather than, than require a, another opt-in from a, a, from this oftmine.com that the website doesn't control, but there's no way to do that without opening yourself as CoinHive did to malicious a ute to well we'll call it malmining. Um, so anyway, it'll be interesting to see how this this proceeds and whether uh, there is a, a uptake and adoption of this. Uh, you know, in return for people's CPUs being pinned, uh, revenue gets generated. So I, I think this is I, I think this is exciting. We'll see what happens. And Leo, time for yes, a coffee sir. break. All right. Let's break it. While you're coffinating, I am going to talk to you about IT Pro TV. These are, of course, no strangers to people listening to this show. In fact, I know a lot of you are already customers. This is for those of you who are not yet customers of IT Pro TV. The fun and entertaining way to get good at IT. Whether you're an IT professional, you just want to expand your knowledge polish your skills, get a better job, or get more pay. Or you're not in IT yet, but you want to get into IT. There's a problem. There's kind of a catch-22 with getting into IT, and that is most jobs will say, okay, what's your experience? And you're just getting into it. You don't have experience. But there is a way around that, the certifications. That's actually why that process was created. Tests that test your IT knowledge, and they're in a variety of areas. And preparing for the tests can be challenging. People may spend tens of thousands of dollars going to technical colleges. Uh, others go to the bookstore, buy a lot of books, cram at night. It's hard work. The easy, fun way to learn everything you need to know fast and affordably is IT Pro TV. Uh, they have five studios. They, Tim and Don started as IT trainers. I mean, training people to get the certs in classrooms, traditional classrooms. But they wanted to do something that scaled better, that worked better, that was more fun. And that's why they created IT Pro TV. It's like a a 24-hour television channel dedicated to IT training. How about that? And fun, too. Five studios in their beautiful Gainesville, uh, uh, new Gainesville facility. I went down there for their grand opening last year. and We had so much fun saw everything they're doing. I'm kind of jealous. They now do 125 hours of live streaming every week. That adds to their more than 3,000 hours of on-demand content in every possible category. Uh, certified Ethical Hacker, the new version 9 certs, CISA SQL Server 2016, Azure 7533, CCNA Security, CompTIA's A+, that's kind of the basic IT you know, fix-it cert. They've got them all. Just go to itpro.tv slash security now, browse the episodes, and you'll see every possible area. You want to learn how to use Wireshark? Uh, you want to learn how to uh, uh, manage a Windows installation, Windows Server, Microsoft Office, Apple? You can watch, uh, of course, on your computer. You can stream it on your browser, but you can also watch on an Android or iOS device. They've got apps. They're uh, Chromecast. They have a Roku, great Roku app, Amazon Fire TV app. They're on Apple TV, everywhere you want to be. And it's nice because it means it's convenient. You can have it on the big screen uh, while you're eating breakfast, get in the car, listen on the phone on the way in, have it in a window on your computer during your workday. And you're just going to absorb so much information. By the way, a great way to keep an IT team up to date as well. They don't have to leave the uh, premises to get their training. They have a wonderful supervisor portal. It gives you complete control of your team's training schedule. You can create custom groups. You can uh, give training assignments, view logins, viewing time, video downloads, course completion tracking, see individual and group analytics. And group pricing means it's even more affordable. Check that out at itpro.tv slash security now. 
Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the team solution, you can contact them there for a team trial. If you want an individual membership, they've got a great deal. Seven-day free trial. If you use the offer code SN30, if at the end of the free trial you want to stick around, you'll save 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. That is a great deal. 90,000 IT Pro TV subscribers now. Premium subscriptions, which include unlimited practice exams from Transcender. Those are worth 100 bucks by themselves. Complete virtual labs, so you don't even really, you just need an HTML5 browser. You don't need anything else. They're normally uh, $857 a year with the discount we're offering, $600, 50 bucks a month. And you get all of that. ITPro.tv slash security now. you got to use the offer code SN30 for that seven-day free trial and 30% off for the life of your active subscription. ITPro TV, flexible training, binge-worthy content. ROI proven. Here's the, uh, this is, they wanted this testimonial. Here's a, this is a good testimonial. I'm James Packer. I'm the general manager of Kirk ISS based in the Cayman Islands. We look after IT for banks, governments, and uh, various other organizations around the Caribbean. IT Pro TV for me first was a personal subscription. Used it for a little while, started to like it, then found out there was a business version. I started off with a small team there of about 20 staff. By the time I finished, I had 110 engineers in the field and we had dozens of IT Pro accounts with the guys training. And last year alone, they passed over 40 certs by wow. using the online training. One thing I can say that, you know, you can't, I can't say for any others is IT Pro TV, I've seen it make people pass exams, help them with the virtual labs, the practice tests, and the ability to check your team are actually doing it. So it, it helps you to make sure you're getting return on your investment. One thing I particularly like about it, it lets you know how many times they've taken the test and whether they failed or not. I can watch it even if they're downloading. So even if they're watching offline, I know they've had a go at it. I built this structure, whereas each time they passed a, an exam, they would get extra money within their salary. But it would also work invertly. If they didn't work towards Ooh. it, they would lose their training account Ooh. to go to another member of staff who wanted to do well for themselves and the company. Because in technology, everybody knows if you were to take an 18 month break, you'd be so far behind, it'd be incredible. It's true. I particularly enjoyed the fact with IT Pro TV, it was easy to use. I could download it, I could listen to it in the car, I could watch it on the train, I didn't have to be connected to watch. And if I was watching it across multiple devices, like my Apple TV in the house, I could see where I was and carry on watching it on my laptop. My current job, running a company in Grand Cayman, I never went for. They saw that I'd added the Azure and the Office 365 search onto my LinkedIn and headhunted me and, uh, asked me to move out and help them out. I think I can safely say um, without IT Pro TV, I wouldn't be where I was today because I only got this job on the back of the qualifications I have. In a tropical paradise, I might add. <laughs> There's a nice testimonial. ITPro.tv slash security now. Use the offer code SN30. We could, let's just both move Want. to uh, the Cayman Islands. What do you say? <laughs> yeah. Uh, on we go. Onward. So yeah, so following up on my my grumbling about the inefficiency of using JavaScript for mining, this is a little out of order in my show notes. Um, I'm just telling Elaine that since she follows, she used the show notes to do the transcripting. But of course, we were talking last week about Browse Aloud, which was the site whose servers were breached, and the malmining uh, uh, Monero Coin Hive was injected into. Remember, 4,275 websites. Many of them were governmental. Uh, 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 CUNY was among them, uh, as of uh, uscourts.gov and a bunch of others. Well, we don't know who the creep was that did this, but as a consequence of the way crypto mining works, we know what success or not that that particular crypto mining address had over the course of that campaign. And in something of a funny quip, uh, I, I, I saw someone comment that it was noted that browser-based crypto mining relies upon placing the mining code on sites people actually visit. Um, so uh, again, a lot of sites got infected. Many of them may have been low traffic, but one way or the other, JavaScript-based mining um, then this whole campaign infecting 4,275 websites generated, minted a grand total <clears throat> of $24. Oh. 
<laughs> so, so, yeah, doesn't I don't think anybody won from that proposition. Either those were not great sites to inject the the mining code onto, or as I said, it just you know it's not generating a lot of money. And and if it's going to be viable, we we need to fix that. Um, so um, I did want to touch on. Um, this question that we first addressed when VW got caught having, to, you know, playing games with the emissions control software on, on I believe it was the diesel uh, VWs, that caused sort of a spotlight to be cast upon other potential um, violators. And it was reported in a German newspaper just this last Sunday that – U.S. investigators um, in looking at Mercedes have found that its cars appear to have been playing similar games. This German newspaper wrote that the documents which they – and they, these were private documents that the newspaper got a hold of – showed that U.S. investigators had found several software functions that helped these uh, the Daimler cars – pass emissions tests, including one which switched off emissions cleaning after 26 kilometers of driving. They found another function in the software um, which allowed emissions cleaning system to recognize whether the car was being tested based on speed or acceleration patterns. And they also found emails from the engineers involved questioning whether these software functions were legal. So, you know, it looks like maybe more than just VW was uh, uh, playing games and that, you know, it's sort of a consequence of how complex our cars have become and the fact that uh, companies just believe they're able to to tuck away uh, uh, whatever technology they want to uh, out of sight. Um now, the flip side of, jo of the inefficiency of JavaScript mining is the efficiency of mining natively on high-performance machines like big iron internet servers. It turns out that uh, the Israeli firm Checkpoint, who is often bringing us uh, interesting bits of news – announced last Friday that they had uncovered the footprint of a large hacking operation targeting something known as Jenkins servers, which were left connected to the Internet. These Jenkins servers are Java-based technology, which are used for uh, developers staging their software. It turns out that they're... they're intended to be used internally, but there were on the order of 25,000 of them exposed um, on the internet. Okay, so the as always, there was a well-known patched vulnerability. This was, uh, this was part of a CVE that was issued last April 26th. So what, 10 months ago. Um, that allowed unauthorized and unauthenticated remote code execution on these Jenkins servers using something known as a as a Java serialization deserialization flaw. Um, Java uses is uses a lot of data structures, and so Java objects are very structure heavy. Um, the the serialization in Java refers to a technique for turning one of these structured objects into a byte sequence, which then allows it to be transmitted or stored. And deserialization is the reverse process. The deserializer reads a sequence of bytes and reassembles the original JavaScript object. Well, probably won't be any surprise to listeners of this podcast that the deserializer is an interpreter. That is, it is an interpreter of the serialized sequence 
And as we often talk about, interpreters are very difficult to get right. They are a, a continuing source of security problems. And it turns out that there was a high profile deserialization pro problem in Java, which afflicted these Jenkins servers. It was known about 10 months ago. Uh, it was patched, but these servers were not updated. So um, despite having been fixed over a year ago, the attackers were able to leverage this known, this known uh, remote code execution via, uh, vulnerability in more than 25,000 exposed servers. And much as we're able, again, not to identify who it was who obtained the money, but we can tell from the from the from the blockchain technology, the cryptocurrency mining technology, um, how successful they were. This had been active for months, and allowed them to already. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's active right now as of this reporting, which was just Friday. Um, they have already cashed out more than. 10,800 Monero, which is over $3.4 million. So here's an example of a crypto mal mining operation, which is succeeding, is running on these Jenkins servers as a consequence of the fact that it is running on the on the bare metal. It's not JavaScript. It's actually running, it, you know, it's running natively on probably very powerful machines. Um, I would imagine that these Jenkins servers are limping along <laughs> because all of their CPU resources is being sucked up by a, a, a crypto, you know, mal mining operation that doesn't care about, you know, sparing any CPU cycles for what the machine was supposed to be doing. And as a consequence, uh, whoever this is, has made 3.4 million U.S. dollars, which is, you know, some serious coin. Um, you know, thus the 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 strength of the impetus to to do cryptocurrency mining. Um, and you know, it's worth noting that with remote code execution vulnerability, such as these servers have, bad guys could have gotten up to all sorts of much more serious you know, in terms of security penetration, corporate espionage and digging around in people's network mischief. But what did they choose to do? They choose to mine cryptocurrency with their access. Um, Bleeping Computer, uh, a terrific site that we refer to often, had a terrific summary reporting on this. Um, uh, in their coverage where they they quoted over 2,500 Jenkins servers left exposed online, they said, attackers aren't the only ones who've noticed the large number of Jenkins servers available online. In mid-January, security researcher uh, Mikhail Tunick published research highlighting that there were over 25,000 Jenkins servers left exposed to internet connections at the time of his research. Also on Friday, that is last week, FireEye, released new research on other hackers leveraging a different flaw, which is being used to infect Oracle WebLogic servers with malware. This vulnerability has been under active exploitation since early December 2017, and one group has already made more than $226,000. So there's a different cryptocurrency mining operation running on Oracle WebLogic servers. Then uh, uh, Bleeping Computer says, besides Jenkins and Oracle WebLogic servers, hackers are also targeting Ruby on Rails, PHP, and IIS, that's Microsoft's servers, also deploying Monero mining malware. Trend Micro fears, they write, that two recently disclosed CouchDB vulnerabilities will also soon be exploited in the same way. They write, Monero mining malware is already this year's biggest malware trend and problem, with numerous malware distribution campaigns spreading such payloads on any unsecure, unsecured computer 
and server that crooks can get their hands on. They finish saying, oh, and then no, then it's me. Uh, you know, that that's what bleeping computer said. And then I was reminded of of that the famous quote, the Willie Sutton quote, thinking that perhaps we should be referring to all these as Willie Sutton attacks, uh, you know, going where the money is. So uh, it's it's interesting that, you know, with the advent of cryptocurrency and exchanges that allow that essentially take the cryptocurrency from being virtual to being real, um, the, as we've been talking about recently, there's now a great deal of pressure to get mining malware running on computers wherever you can find them. Uh, and it's generating dollars, not just, you know, random mischief or worms that propagate for their own entertainment, but for no other purpose. Now, unfortunately, for better or worse, we've given them purpose. Um, I just wanted to make a quick note from this. This is from the C Some Secrets Cannot Be Kept Department. Um, that reports of the first unquote uncrackable in quotes Windows 10 Universal Windows platform, that's the UWP based game, has reportedly been liberated from its captivity. It's not, uh, who knows why they chose this one. The game is Zoo Tycoon Ultimate Animal Collection, which has been cracked. Uh, the cracking group. Codex says that they, they, in order to do this, they needed to successfully penetrate five separate layers of DRM protection. So, doing this was not easy. Um, but we've we you know from the beginning of this podcast, we've we've noted that there are some things which cannot be protected. Our first example was the encryption of DVDs back when. Uh, you know, there was that effort underway because if the console in your living room needed to decrypt the DVD to show it to you, well, all of the every, everything you needed to know to decrypt it was right there. Similarly, if someone is playing a game on their computer, despite any efforts that anyone could make in order to 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 corral it and control it and 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 prevent it from being from getting loose you know it's running on a machine which it is able to to penetrate all those five layers so it's just a matter of someone patiently doing the reverse engineering in order to to pry that apart um we all got updates to those of us using apple stuff uh ios for uh, iphone and ipad uh tv os uh, for Apple TV, Watch OS, uh, and even the Mac OS for a problem that Apple clearly knew about before it went public. We know that Apple knew about it because the the planned next sort of semi-major release of iOS, that's 11.3 that we should be getting soon. That's the one that I'm looking forward to because it removes the the, the speed throttling of older devices and or at least gives a user some control over it and notification and also apparently uh, clear reports on the health of your battery as the phone sees it. Um, that's the one that's coming, 11.3. Um, Apple, it turns out, had a problem with 11.2.5. Um, uh, it's known as the, is, is it pronounced uh, Telugu? Um, you know, I don't it, know. We were debating it. I think it's Telugu, <laughs> something like that. It's an Indian yeah. Uh, dialect. Yeah. Uh, it's the third most spoken language native to South India. And it turns out that, and the, also, was there was another, uh, was it, I don't think it was Belize, Bul B Bulgarian? There was some other language character that was later discovered Um there's a fabulous posting. If anyone is interested in, like, just for grins, understanding exactly that every technical detail of what was about, what this crash was about, I've got a link to a a page on GitHub.io, a, a, a blog page there that really dissects this uh, problem, uh, courtesy of Simon Zarafa, who sent that to me. And anyway, the bottom line is that. Um, uh, sending a, uh, a Unicode 
character sequence in this Telugu, uh, you using these Telugu characters was able to crash these various devices. Apple knew about it. It doesn't, for example, crash the beta of 11.3. So they fixed it there. But news escaped. It began getting exploited in the wild. And so Apple was forced to push out a quick update, basically, that they'd already fixed and would have disappeared without anyone knowing about it. Uh, in 11.3, they had to move it, us. It's a Bengali dialect. It's oh, Bengali. Indian, that's right. Indian yes. Yeah, or Indic. Yes, thank you. I knew it was a B word. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're Indic. So there you have these strange ligatures tying these characters together. Right. And this is a great blog post. It kind of explains why it's diff what, what's going on. Yeah, the guy yeah. took it, really uh, yeah. dissected it and, yeah. and pulled it apart for yeah. us. Yeah, really good. So, um, okay, this one, Leo, you're gonna have to, you're gonna want to look at the on the next page here under the the page starts with eternal glue. There's a picture of a network of computers. This is a little chilling. Um, uh, the NCC group that we've talked about before, they're a well-known security group. Um, they were contracted by an unknown or unnamed. Uh, client. I don't know. You can you can't really even read this. It's just it's a weird. Right. Um, but notice that it all starts in the upper left with yeah. a single machine, yeah. and that what we're seeing is we're we're, we're seeing an infection branching uh. out within an organization. Um, so they so as we know, Eternal Blue uses the NSA's leaked SMB version one exploit. They call this eternal glue uh, a rebuilt, not Petya. Remember that Petya and WannaCry were the two different pieces of malware based on eternal blue. Um, they, so they, they, they write, in June 2017, so last summer, we were asked by a client to rebuild not Petya from scratch. Instead of the data destruction payload, they asked for telemetry and safeguards. Why? Because they wanted to measure what the impact of NotPetya, that is essentially a, a, a leveraging of the eternal blue exploit, would have been for them. They, they, they said, um, uh, we've completed the first phase of live testing in a secure environment deployed by our client. They said, it has been a marathon, not a sprint. By the time we emerged from testing the code and the associated safeguards in December 2017, we had already been working with our customer in the lab for a number of months. This slow and steady approach has ensured everything works as intended and the quality of telemetry is sufficient to answer the client's questions. Then they wrote, Christmas comes early. Eternal glues first outing. And that's what this picture shows. They wrote, on, on the 7th of December, Eternal Glue got its first outing on the customer's engineering network. Uh, and so they said, i.e., a live network, but not corporate. Now, okay, if, if this is their engineering network, this is a big customer. So, you know, uh, so who we, we don't know who this is, that there's an unidentified client. But they said the result more data than one could have imagined and interesting insights as to the propagation in live environments. So they wrote the headlines from phase one of the experiment were, okay, now get this. The customer ran this eternal glue. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to call it malware, uh, experiment where on one machine in their engineering network with no privileges, it found three machines unpatched. It exploited those three machines to obtain kernel level access. It infected those three machines. Within 10 minutes, <coughs> excuse me, it had gone through the entire engineering network using recovered and stolen credentials. It then took the domain about two minutes later. 
107 hosts were owned in roughly 45 minutes before the client initiated the kill and remove switch. So, so here was a, a, um, uh, you know, a, a sandboxed, deliberately safe, carefully engineered leverage of, I mean, today, an, the SMB version one, which has long since been patched by Microsoft, operating successfully within an existing organization. You know, it found a couple machines which had escaped patching, got into them, used its position there to establish a beachhead, get into the kernel, get credentials, and then move through the network. So um, if nothing else, this should be a, ch a chilling note that, that, that you, if you have something as potent as the eternal blue vulnerability is, you have to be really, really sure that you don't have a single machine that is vulnerable to it because it doesn't just let you get in. It lets you get down into that machine through that vulnerability. And from there, maybe, you know, do much more damage, even in a network where other things are patched against it. So it just used it used eternal blue or in this case, they called their system, of course, eternal glue in order to escape. But it once it got kernel level on a couple of the machines it escaped to, uh, you know, in a short time, it, it was in infected 107 different machines in their engineering network. So uh, interesting and certainly chilling. And I would say the client got their money's worth from the, uh, the commissioning of that test by the NCC group. Um, <laughs> just a, a passing a fun story um, about a small mining, Bitcoin mining operation in someone's residence. T-Mobile complained that massive radio frequency interference emanating from a local residence, and I don't know where, the, where it was located, uh, at 700 megahertz was significantly interfering with the delivery of the company's cellular services. <laughs> you know, when, when, of course, when, when they first came out with these high gigahertz processors, everybody was wondering, you know, they, yep. we're now, they're not broadcasting in, you know, broadcast ranges. Is this going to be a problem? It's the first time I've heard of it actually being a problem. Yeah. Uh, the FCC's Enforcement Bureau said that they contacted the residents. I mean, they I'm sure they drove a truck past and probably the antennas melted. Um, they uh, they contacted the people and said that continued use of the, it was called the Ant Miner S4. And there was some confusion in the reporting because there's also reference to an Ant Miner S5. Yep, there it is. That continued use of it. It's hard. Presumably, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So so and, and and what you do of course is you have a hundred you know, rack rack <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah. or thousands of them rack yeah. after rack after rack. This was in Each Brooklyn. So that's why ah. the FCC cuz the FCC has like five enforcement vehicles. So it's kind of amazing right. that they could find it. Right. Right. Well, of course T-Mobile was able to say our cell tower has gone down. So yeah, they knew where know, it was, yeah. Yeah, they 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 had a good idea where it was. So they said um uh, if it if they, they said continued use uh, would sub be subject to fines, criminal prosecution, or siege seizure of equipment. So yes, kids, uh, you you may depending upon where you're located, uh, you know, <laughs> may be disrupting cellular service within a, a perimeter of your so mining operation. It's, it's the processor. I mean, 700 megahertz. Is it the GPU? What is it's something? And it, and then it's got to be transmitting like crazy. Well, yeah. Remember that any time any time a wire has its charge rapidly changed, that will emit a bit of radio. So so you know, sine wave changes don't, but an edge produces a huge high you know a uh, large spectrum of interference. So. 
basically, you know, I mean, I, I, I know you know, Leo, that like all of the computer cases that we've seen recently, they've got gasketing and, you know, and, and sometimes or even remember the Apple II, the inside of the case was like sprayed with yeah, that gray right. metal stuff. Right. Um, so you really have to go to some lengths to to prevent radio frequency from escaping from anything digital that is going fast. And of course, you know, mining equipment, the last thing they're thinking about yeah. is RF interference. These, are, these I mean, are these are made in China. I doubt very much they have FCC B, you know, approval or anything. No like that. chance. Yeah. No chance. Yeah. And and what now now they're what? At at the T nine? So that was the yeah, S four. This, this is an old the, model. You know, you right. can buy them cheap on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty funny. <laughs> so, um, a little bit under the cloud, uh, or un 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 under the hood, rather, of about Chrome's ad filtering. Uh, as our listeners may already know, the, what we talked about some months back that, that Google had announced Chrome was going to do was the so-called intrusive ad blocking. And I know you talked about this also on, on o over the weekend, Leo. Um, it went live in Chrome on Thursday. And so, I, I, you know, from a technology standpoint, I thought it'd be interesting to get some sense for like what's the, what this is all about. So Google explained the day before in a blog posting in their Chromium blog, like what was the basis for this and what were they trying to do? Um, it started with a survey of 40,000 internet users throughout North America, which was taken by a group known as the Coalition for Better Ads, wanting basically to, you know, show them a bunch of things and rate how annoying different types of advertising was. They're, the two most annoying were the so-called, the, the pre stitchal page, which covers where you are, um, with a countdown and but before you're able to get through to it to the site, you know, I mean, Forbes does this, but I don't really mind because you're able to click past it. So it's like, OK. Um, and then the, the the second most annoying were the flashing animated ads. So Google notes in their in their coverage of this and their description of what they're doing in Chrome, that while some problematic ads are sourced by the advertising supplier, meaning, as we've talked about this often, a site creates a rectangular, you know, like sets aside a rectangular area and then the advertiser puts whatever they're going to put in there, meaning that the site doesn't control necessarily the content. They wrote, um, the majority of problematic experiences, user experiences are under the control of and at the specification of the site's owner, such as high advertising density and things like the prestitial page covers that, you know, is script running on the site that, that does this. So Google write, writes, quote, this result led to the approach Chrome takes to protect users from many of the intrusive ad experiences identified by the better ads standards, which is evaluate how well sites comply with the better ad standards, inform sites of any issues encountered, provide the opportunity for sites to address the identified issues and remove ads from sites that continue to maintain a problematic ads experience. I won't go through all the details that I have in the show notes. If anyone's interested, they can look there. But, but essentially, um, Google is, is giving sites or has been giving sites notice through the API if, the, if behavior that Google is seeing through Chrome is in violation. And if Google, starting last Thursday, would be taking action against those sites based on this updated set of policies. And they conclude the posting saying, early results are showing positive progress for users. Of course, Google is couching all this as, look, you know, we're not wanting everyone to run ad blocking. We're hoping we can take the pressure off of users, you know, taking the, their own actions by 
coming up with some compromise. So they're saying uh, in, in, their, in their summary, they said, while the result of this action is that Chrome users will not see ads on sites that consistently violate the better ad standards, our goal is not to filter any ads at all, but to improve the experience for all web users. As of February 12th, so that's what, uh, about two weeks ago, 42% of sites which were failing the better ad standards have resolved their issues and are now passing. This is the outcome, they write, we were hoping for, that sites would take steps to fix intrusive ads experiences themselves and benefit all web users. They say, however, if a site continues to maintain non-compliant ad experiences 30 days after being notified of violations, Chrome will begin to block ads on that site. We are encouraged, they conclude, by early results showing industry shifts away from intrusive ad experiences and look forward uh, and look fo uh, forward to continued collaboration with the industry toward a future where Chrome's ad filtering technology will not be needed. So um, this is, you know, strikes me as, as a good thing, but also it's a little scary. I mean, it's a web browser um, choosing to enforce a set of policies, which it assumes are what its users want, um, and uh, changing the content of the sites. Now, it is the case that when you go to a site where Chrome has made some changes, you will see a notification, typically a bar along the bottom, where you are able to opt out of of Chrome's filtering of what it considers to be intrusive ads on that site. So the user has control, user has notification if Chrome has done this. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how this goes. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, Google has been using, as we've often talked about on the podcast, their power, uh, the power of being the majority browser on the web now to make lots of changes in security now we're seeing some clear changes in in advertising content. So, um, you know, with appropriate controls and maybe with a, a good outcome, we can hope. Certainly, the the annoying ads are annoying well, to I all of us. Forbes doesn't put up that interstitial anymore. I don't know if that's uh, <laughs> just a coincidence, but I just went Interesting. there. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I just had one quick little tweet about uh, my software, Spinrite, uh, something I didn't know. Scott Napier, I, I saw this tweet as I was going back through my, my Twitter feed pulling the, the show together. He said, at SGGRC, Spinrite has quite literally helped to keep the physical security of the Smithsonian intact. Hmm. And I have convinced <laughs> some skeptics of its power. Looking forward to 6.1. Kind of a cryptic tweet there. What do you think? So, uh, yeah, uh, who knows that some? It may be that the security system for the Smithsonian uh, uses uh, uh, hard drives that were having trouble, uh, at like or the system like went down and it was like, ooh, crap. Let's you know we need our security back up. Run spin right, uh, and apparently in the process, skeptics were convinced. So. Thank you, Scott, for, for sharing that. And Leo, uh, I think time for our last break, and then we will close the loop mm -hmm. and talk about Russian meddling technology. Scott doesn't say specifically who he works for, but his uh, Twitter account ah. says he is a slave to the man, CCTV guru, guru closed circuit TV guru. Ah, and that he does, makes sense. Uh, he lives in uh, Maryland. Yep. So uh, I'm thinking he might have something to do with the security cameras at the Smithsonian. <laughs> I went to his website, but I'm forbidden access. Uh oh, mm. <laughs> that, that looks more like a, a <laughs> website error than actually a security issue. But who knows? It is time, my friends and neighbors, to talk a little bit about our sponsor for this particular portion of the show, the good folks at Rocket Mortgage. If you're ready to buy a home, I know... Steve's never moving from his 
condo made of stona by but fortress the, of solitude yes but <laughs> but if you are looking to buy a new home or maybe refi this is a great place to go quicken loans the number one lender in the country in, in terms of customer satisfaction for sure number one according to jd power for the last eight years but uh, also, you know, I think it's $92 billion in loans. I mean, they're a big lender, and they're very – the thing I like about them, they're very technologically savvy. They really understood that the mortgage experience just wasn't keeping up with the times. You know, you go have to go to a lender, go to the bank, ask – you know, fill out paperwork, like with a pen on a piece of paper. And then, as if that weren't enough, you have to go home and find documentation, you know, your pay stubs and your bank mm -hmm. statements and all this stuff, and then fax it to them. Fax it to them. Crazy. All of this straight out of the 90s or earlier, maybe the 1890s. So they came up with something Quicken Loans calls Rocket Mortgage to lift the burden of applying for a home loan or a refi, by the way. And now is a very good time to refi. Interest rates are definitely going up. Uh, so get the good ones now, right, while you can. So here's the deal. You could do it entirely online. That is, that is a big deal. Entirely online mortgage approval process. And it's so simple, so easy it's not a long application form. You could actually do it on your phone at an open house. While the realtor's looking at you, you could go, well, wait, wait, wait. I think we can swing this. Let's see. You go, you enter your name, address, birth date, that kind of thing. Stuff you already know. They've got relationships with all the financial institutions. So as soon as you say, I give permission to give that information to Quicken Loans, boom. They go there. They get all the information they need. And based on your income, your assets, your credit, they crunch the numbers all of this happens really fast. Computers, light speed, uh, like in minutes, while the realtor's looking at you, tapping her lacquered nails on the beautiful Corian countertop that you want to buy, you're going to say, look, I'm approved. Minutes later, you pick the term, the rate, the down payment. That's it. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash security now. Rocketmortgage.com slash security now. Uh, same thing for a refi. We had visitors in the studio the other day who said, we did a refi at Rocket Mortgage. Easily the best rates we got anywhere. Rocketmortgage.com slash security now. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLSconsumeraccess.org number 3030. Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. Rocketmortgage.com slash security now. Steve? So um, I've decided after reading an incredible number of suggestions for the what we call the combination of meltdown and specter, you know, this the single word attempts, that there probably isn't a good one. But we do have one that is unique. It hasn't been suggested yet. Um, oh boy. Which, so I will, I will call that the, I'll call that the winner. Several people decided they liked S and M, which was what I uh, <laughs> finished with last week. But nah. anyway, so just to remind people about how many different ways there are to put these words or word fragments together. Since I mean, just in 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 going through the notes, my, my Twitter feed since last week, Nico D Smith says, "How about spec down?" Life cream scoop. How about smelt down? Matt Felton suggests. <laughs> what about mel spec? A, tw a twist on the word mil spec, for of course meltdown inspector. Uh, uh, Eat seventy eight. How about he says? How about spec melt? Carol say suggests melt spec, but of then I got. I finally saw one that was a little different. That. I get kind of hooked me again. I just think it's, we're not going to end up with, you know, actually using it, but bcrypt.c, which is kind of an interesting handle, you yeah, know, bcrypt is a, mm. is a, is a crypto. Mm. Anyway, he uh, suggests down spect D O W N S P E C apostrophe D, uh, which is kind of cute uh, because the consequence of this was that we had to, reduce the specifications of our processors. They were down spec Oh, so, I like that, yeah. Meltdown and Spectre down spec So that's kind of the down spec attacks. So right. anyway, of, of all of them, I think that one wins. 
Uh, I thank everybody for their suggestions. Please, no more. I think every possible combination of pieces of those words have been put together, but we did come across a new one. So thank everybody. Thank you, everybody. Downspect. I think that's, you know, of, of those I've seen. Um, Doug White, uh, tweeting as at CPU guru, sent two things. He said, aloha, Steve. So maybe he's in Hawaii somewhere. Just an FYI that I upgraded my Comcast, Comcast internet service to one gig speed last week. Trying to run the speed test resulted in about 460 megabits throughput, even though the technician showed one gig at the port. He says, I remembered an earlier podcast about the Edge Router X and that the internal throughput would be only about half a gig. So I purchased an Edge Router 4, replaced the Edge Router X. Now I have my one gig throughput. He said, figured I'd mention, mention my experience as I imagine there are other home routers that will be likewise speed limited, even though they advertise one gig ports. And that's really, thank you, that, thank you, Doug. That's really good information because. Mm -hmm. We had a radio guy called, guy called the radio show. I think he was using Eros and he was getting 600 megabits. So maybe that's yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the fact that you've got one gig ports does and it means that the wire can carry that traffic, but it doesn't mean that that the complex routing and switching logic, which figures out where to send each packet at what is really a very high rate, is able to keep up with the so-called line rate of the actual connections. And then in Doug's second tweet, which was actually came in at a different time, uh, but probably as a part of this work he was doing, he said, if you're running a ubiquity edge router, Looks like new firmware dropped last week. So I just, as a as a listener service announcement, and I know because I know that a lot of our listeners are using the Ubiquity routers as a consequence of our affection for them, and how, which is part of the fact, partly because they are so powerful from a from a configuration standpoint. You know, they're actual routers uh, where you can give each of the ports of this little box its own network and subnetwork in order to create isolation just wanted to say that you know i mean and all that for what is it 49 dollars that uh new firmware is available so everybody may want to go check in with ubiquity and update themselves two last tweets chip steiner said when your isp dns has the best performance he says parents using dns bench which of course is grc's very popular utility for measuring DNS performance. He says, when your ISP DNS has the best performance over Google DNS, Quad9, Open DNS, but it uses DNS filtering, what's your advice? Well, that's and I don't easy. really have one. Well, well I mean, what? what? You're going you're gonna to opt for performance over security or in injected ads, right? Exactly. I... Um, that DNS filtering is troublesome because it means that the, your ISP is, you know, in your business and, as you said, is able to perform various sorts of, of, of uh, involvement. You, you know, you would like when you enter a domain name that doesn't exist to get a DNS error. Instead, ISPs often use the opportunity to return a page with, you know, their own search suggestions or, you know, their own advertisement of one's form or another. Um, so uh, my sense is that using DNS Bench is informative. I mean, it, it, give, it gave Chip a, a, a sense for the ranking of his options, but... Then try to see what it feels like in the real world. Because remember, the DNS is cached. It's cached at several levels um, within your own system. And the benchmark deals with both cached and uncached queries. So I would say, you know, maybe try your ISP's DNS, get a feel for the way surfing the web feels, and then switch over to one of the of, of like, like to Quad Nine or Open DNS that is performing customer facing filtering for security, which I think is very valuable. 
and see if you actually notice a difference. It's one thing for a benchmark to be able to find a difference. It's not at all clear what that means in terms of actual experience. So I, I, I guess I would say use the information from the benchmark, but then decide for yourself, uh, you know, how you feel about the actual result either way. Oh, and this is very cool. Chris Ryan uh, sent me a tweet. I saw this link for an IoT checker to see if your devices are on Shodan and thought I'd share. Okay, so here's what this does. This is very cool. You can query Shodan for your own IP to see if there are any entries in the Shodan database for your home network, oh. which would be good to know. Yeah. But this this automates that. IoT scanner dot bullguard dot com. So IoT S C A N N E R dot B U L L G U A R D dot com. And you, there are two levels of test. The first is a passive just so so because you know when you go to IoT scanner dot bullguard dot com it has your IP in the same way that Shields Up, you know, GRC's test does. So it's then able to submit that IP using the Shodan API to see if Shodan reports any results. Um, and so you're turning up clear on your network, which we would hope. That's good. Um, then if you want to, you can go to the next level and ask showed and use this IoT scanner.bullguard.com to actively scan your current public IP to see if it is able to find anything. And again, you came up clean, Leo. And I did it both of my networks uh, here and uh, uh, over at my residence. And uh, they both came up clear yeah. at both levels of scan. So it's like, yes, good. But it's absolutely going to be the case that some of our listeners are going to discover something uh, that doesn't make them happy when they do this. So iotscanner.bullguard.com. And thank you, Chris, for bringing that to my attention so I could tell everybody. Okay. So um, Russian meddling technology. Um, <laughs> it sounds like something you need foundry for. <laughs> yes. So last Friday... We know that special counsel Robert Mueller, uh, his investigation into the the question of Russian interference with the 2016 U.S. presidential election re released an indictment naming 33 Russian individuals and three Russian companies accusing them of violating U.S. criminal law. Uh, I remember being sort of non Plus by that, it's like, OK, well, so, OK. Um, so the indictment charged the defendants with conspiracy to defraud the U.S., wire fraud and identity theft. And so, as we know, this is a technology, not a, a not a politics podcast. But what interests me and I think is of interest to us here is not and should not be for this purpose, the election politics aspect of the effort, but on the technical side of what was done to pull this off. And I think this is relevant, not only for technical interest, but because we're hearing now a, a lot in the news uh, and among the talking heads and commentators uh, that Google, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and others were or at least to some degree um, to be determined, were responsible, maybe negligent, that they should have known better to like to have their services abused in this fashion. So as I've looked at, you know, like into what we learned, um, in many ways, as I mentioned at the top of the podcast, this struck me as being reminiscent of U.S. law enforcement and the U.S. FBI complaining about the use of encryption and the Internet going dark problem, you know, de and demanding a golden key for access. It, it, my point being that it comes down to technology and 
technology is a world that we understand. So the indictment alleges that, re- that Russians purchased servers located in the United States in order to obfuscate their origins and then created and established hundreds of fake personas on social media which they careful with which they carefully or the, the 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 personas which they carefully developed into leaders of public opinion so you know they they established essentially ip addresses in the us and and then went about investing in the creation of social media personas they used virtual private networks to open and operate social media accounts um, and in that way behaving exactly as any US citizen might you know a lot of a lot of users use VPNs for various reasons in public settings in hotels in in open Wi-Fi settings in order to get security and privacy um, and they also found and alleged that that Russian agents stole U.S. identities to open accounts with PayPal to to further substantiate and support these these false personas and identities and used those to purchase advertisements on social media sites. So the bottom line is, you, you know, leveraging the technology of the Internet, which is is about freedom and openness and anonymity to varying degrees, they were able to convincingly pose as U.S. citizens to, and also, again, just um, by nature of, of the, the way social media works today, they were able to recruit through this technology um, real paid Americans to also engage in political activities, to promote political campaigns, stage political rallies. And those Americans that had been recruited had no idea nor any reason to suspect that they were communicating with Russian agents. I loved your accent uh, verbally at the beginning of this, Leo, (laughs) because it occurred to me that, you know, there's no accent in a tweet. No, you know there, no. there. There's no way to know how good. I mean, as long as the written English is convincing, um, there's a, a, a an inherent disconnection. So, um, interestingly, the indictment alleges that in some cases the Russians fomented unrest on both sides of the political divide at the same time. It said that, quote, after the election, the defendants allegedly staged rallies to support the president while simultaneously staging rallies to protest his election. In one instance, the Russian defendants organized one rally to support the president-elect and another rally to oppose him, both in New York on the same day. So, you know, there was just a, a concerted effort to stir things up. Um, so, you know, here we are, we in the U S invented the internet. It was our technology and we're collectively profiting mightily from its existence, largely because it's such an, a wide open communications platform. But what happened was that an adversarial country very cleverly used our own technologies and even our own bandwidth on our soil against our nation's interest. Now, what I liked in this was something that Mike Masnick at Tech Dirt wrote that I think helps to, to nicely frame sort of like where we go from here. Um, uh, he did a posting titled DOJ Russia Indictment again highlights why internet companies can't can't, C-A-N apostrophe T, cannot just wave a magic wand to make bad stuff go away. He says, this was not just some run-of-the-mill pretend-to-be-Americans. This was a hugely involved process to make it very difficult 
to determine that they were not Americans. He writes, I've seen some people online claiming that this shows why the platforms have to take more responsibility for who is using their platform. And then he quotes a, a tweet from a Rene Desresta, uh, uh, who tweets from at no upside on February 16th. Uh, Rene tweeted while you, re while you read the Mueller indictment, remember the tech CEO mantra quote, we don't want to be the arbiters of truth, unquote. Um, the tweet goes on. These platforms were used exactly as they were designed to be used. Here we are a year later and still no accountability or governance, ends this tweet. So Mike continues, but my read on it is exactly the opposite. It shows just how ridiculous such a demand is. Would any of us, he asks, be using these various services if we were all forced to go through a detailed background check just to use a social media platform? That seems, he writes, excessive and silly. Part of the reason why these platforms are so useful and powerful in the first place is that they're available for nearly everyone to use with few hurdles in the way. That obviously has negative consequences in the form of trolling and scams and malicious behavior. But there's also a ton of really good stuff that has come out of it. He says, we should be pretty cautious before we throw away all the value of these platforms just because some people use them for nefarious purposes. People are always going to be able to hide their true intentions from the various platforms. And the response to that shouldn't be put more blame on the platforms. It should be a recognition of why it's so silly to blame the tools and services for the actions of the users. He says, yes, he finishes, yes, we should be concerned about foreign attempts to influence our elections, while noting that the U.S. itself has a long history of doing the same damn thing, he writes, in other countries. So this is a bit of blowback. But blaming the technology platforms the Russians used seems to be totally missing the point of what happened and risks making the Internet much worse for everyone else. And I can't find much argument with that position because when I mean, maybe you can apply sophisticated AI heuristics or or, you know, maybe do a somewhat better job, but it's not at all clear how somebody who has an agenda, even if it's foreign inspired, uh, differs from an American who who has an opinion. So anyway, I thought it was interesting that, you know, the the tech, you know, they're using technology, uh, given that these uh, that this indictment and these allegations are are true, using technology um, in a way that it was designed uh, essentially residing in the U.S. and acting for their own ends. And it's not at all clear how how it's easy to, to say to, or to do more than simply, you know, jump up and down and uh, up, up and down and stamp our feet and say we want it to be different. Yeah. But how, how do you pull that off? So there. You're not drawing me into this one. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, can see, I can see you waiting. And that's our podcast, folks. <laughs> Episode 651. I can see you for waiting. February right. 20th, 2018. It is diff it's a very difficult problem. It is a problem, and yeah. it's one we've got. It'll be interesting to see uh, what happens moving forward. You don't want to limit free speech. Nope. Uh I'd be a little more sanguine about it if Twitter and Facebook had been a little more forthcoming. You know, they they haven't been helpful at all. Yeah. But uh, you're right. I mean, I don't know exactly how, you know, you don't want a proof of uh, identity. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. And obviously the proof of identity, uh, they got around it with the identity thieves. Yes, Exactly. Well, Steve, we uh, we do this show, uh, and there's plenty, and I'm sure you'll hear from people both sides of the equation, but there's uh, plenty more to talk about every Tuesday, around about uh, 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern, 21.30 UTC, we convene and discuss the latest 
in security news with this guy right here, Steve Gibson. You'll find him at grc.com, the Gibson Research Corporation. While you're there, pick up his bread and butter, Spinray, the world's best hard drive recovery and maintenance utility. If it's good enough for the Smithsonian... It's good enough for you. <laughs> GRC. And you know, you know, you know that it was on the International Space Station too. Spinrite was. Yeah, I a didn't copy know that. was sent. A, a copy was sent up some time ago. They they liked it because they were literally counting bytes, and it was so small as a recovery utility that they were able to stick nice. it on like a floppy with a whole bunch of other stuff uh, like utilities that they needed, rather than it needing its own, you know megabytes of of space and so yeah it was used on the international space station for for quite some time very interesting i did not know that speaking of famous locations where spin right has been used well you <laughs> ought to have it in your house if you've got hard drives you need spin right uh we also uh, he has uh, the uh, show there of course uh 64 kilobit mp3s and transcripts elaine ferris writes those all out in whatever order steve refers to things even when he messes it around, uh, you, you can just find that. Read along as you listen uh, at grc.com. We have video as well as audio at our site, twit.tv slash SN for security now. And, of course, you can always subscribe in your favorite podcast appliance, and that way you'll get every episode the minute it comes out. Collect all 651. You need the complete set. Hey, it's just bits. Come on. There's plenty. You're not in the space station, for crying out loud. Um, we, uh, will be back next Tuesday, but in the meantime, I think you have a little more time to take our Twitch survey if you want to. We don't collect information about our users in any other fashion, but once a year we like to do a little short survey and find out whatever you're willing to tell us about yourself. Like you like big giant cups of coffee, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know if we ask about that. What coffee cup size would you prefer? Maybe we should add that to the next quiz, next survey. That uh, works for me. How much? How many <laughs> grams of caffeine do you consume? Twitch.tv slash survey. Uh, don't forget, it's very easy to listen to our shows on your voice-activated device, no matter who makes it. Apple, uh, Google, even Microsoft, and of course, Amazon. Just ask for uh, security now. Say, hey, you know who? Hey, Echo, I want to listen to security now. And it'll play you the most recent episode. You can often listen to the live stream as well. Just say, I want to listen to Twit Live. Um, uh, oh, and we're also on the Flash Briefing. Uh, many of our shows, we just do little one or two minute clips that if you listen to the Flash Briefing on your Amazon Echo, go to the uh, Echo app on your phone and add Twit to your Flash Briefing rundown. I think I've said enough. I'm going to shut up now and wish you all a wonderful evening. And we'll see you next time on Security. Thanks, buddy. Bye. Security now.